All right, let's get going. Uh, please chat in if, uh, if anyone has trouble hearing me. Welcome, first of all, I'm Kyle Held. And on behalf of Miramichi Green, uh, we thank you all for joining us. We do have a big crowd today, nearly uh, 100 folks from all over the country registered for today's session. Uh, in fact, we have folks joining us from as far away as Asia. Uh, we have a few few more folks coming in. So Alex, uh, if you'll admit them as they, as they come. Uh, because we have so many people on the call, we're gonna keep the participants' microphones muted and we ask that you type in any questions or comments that arise using the Zoom feature, uh, the Zoom chat feature. And at the end of the session, we're gonna do our best to answer as many of those questions uh, as possible. So first, let me provide a brief introduction of today's webinar, Miramichi Green and today's co-hosts. As you should know, because you registered, today's webinar will address two of the most common problems impacting soil health. And soil health is at the root of plant health. And at Miramichi Green, we market products that improve plant health while reducing the long-term costs for landscapers and property managers. Our products are used by professionals for sports fields, golf courses, equestrian courses, campuses, parks, and of course, in yards across America. Here are a few slides showing the many fine uh, organizations we're proud to use your Michi product. Today's webinar is presented by Michael Garan. Michael is a former assistant golf course superintendent with nearly 30 years of experience in both field work and sales management in the green industry. And he's one of Miramichi Green's most knowledgeable team members on soil testing and remediation. He's also an avid outdoorsman who just returned late last night from vacation. So uh, he's, uh, he's feeling it today. So uh, uh, please be sure to give him a hard time. Co-hosting today are Lonnie Drake and Alexandra Miloski. Lonnie, our territory manager uh, for the West, is responsible for us putting on this webinar in the first place. This is the first webinar we're hosting and it was his persistence that made it happen. So if you find it valuable, please be sure to let us know at the end of the presentation and we'll make sure Lonnie gets uh, a little bit of the credit. But if you hate today's webinar, please let us know that too and we'll make sure that Lonnie gets all of the blame. Um, joking aside though, if you do like this, please let us know and we're looking forward to putting together future webinars on the topics that, that you request. Uh, and lastly, before we get a big thank you, uh, as I mentioned to Alex, our Director of Marketing and Product Registration. Many of you probably have chatted with her via text or another of our support channels like Instagram. And like all things Miramichi Green, she was instrumental in putting this uh, event together. Today, she'll be helping me field your chats for the Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, throughout the, the course, we'll have a few polls that will, will pop up. If you see those uh, with some questions, please, uh, please give us your feedback as we go. And again, thank you uh, sincerely for joining us during the busy workday. And without further ado, I will hand the baton to Michael Grant. Thank you, Kyle. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Great, thank you. Okay, well, as Kyle said, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction about myself real quick, just so hopefully we can kind of relay uh, experiences as we go here. But um, I grew up in the Midwest and when I was about 14, I started caddying at a local private golf club. And I can remember being out there caddying and seeing the guys mow greens and rake sand traps, things like that. And I thought, gosh, I bet that would be a cool job to have someday. So. You know, fast forward a few years later, uh, it was summer, summer break during my freshman year of college. And I decided to take a job at another golf course, just to summer work. At that point in my life, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And superintendent, I guess, saw some potential in me and kind of took me under his wing. So at that point, kind of changed my major, changed my focus and decided to go to school to be a golf course superintendent. So I did that for about 10 years, it took me about 10 years to realize I had no life. So um, got out of the field and then worked for several different distributors for about 20 years. And now I've been with Miramichi about seven years. So um, as Kyle mentioned, I'm, I'm going over 30 years now in the green industry. So um, hopefully you know, when I'm you know, going through some of this, um, I know we've got a mix of business owners, property managers, distributors. Hopefully, you know, I've been in your shoes, so I can, like I said, kind of relate with um, what you guys are going through, whether you're in the field or you're a distributor. So 
we'll go ahead and get started, talk about the importance of soil health. So do you guys remember this guy, right? FDR, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. So even back in the 30s, remember back in the Dust Bowl days, um, you know, they were not practicing very good erosion control practices. That combined with the drought really created some major issues. So even back then they knew the importance of soil health. Um, you know, we kind of need to rediscover that as an industry. All right, so what makes up ideal soil? So if we could say, okay, we're gonna design the perfect soil, we've got a lab setting, we're gonna just make up soil, what would that look like? If we're trying to grow you know, plants, golf greens, grass, what have you. So in a perfect world, we're gonna have 25% water, 25% air, 45% mineral, and then 5% organic matter. So again, that would be the ideal scenario, right? If we could make that in a lab, perfect for what we want. What is reality? This is a reality for most of us, right? So there's almost no such thing as topsoil in the world anymore, especially with construction. So, you know, this, I hesitate to even call this soil. This is more, I would call this dirt. Um, you can see it's all been scraped off, it's been leveled. So this is really the opposite of what we would want for growing, right? So this is designed for putting a building on or a parking lot. It's compacted. There's gonna be no organic matter in there. Um, it's not going to drain well. All the things that are good for building, you know, essentially are not good for plant materials. So what do we do to try to remedy that and, you know, get this back to, you know, what we would consider good soil? So to start with that, we kind of need to know our soil texture. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world, there's really four parts to any soil. It's, there's clay, there's silt there's loam and there's sand. And we'll talk about why those are important. So you may, may have done this back in grade school, pretty simple test to kind of get a snapshot of what you're dealing with. But you simply take, take a jar, fill it up about halfway full of soil, fill the rest up with water, shake it up, let it sit for a while, things will settle out. So you know, obviously sand is the bigger, heavier particle that's gonna to go to the bottom. Silt's gonna be in the middle. And then clay is always your, your lightest particle. That's going to float up to the top. And you know, we'll get into a minute and why those are important. A lot of this is common sense, right? So obviously sand is porous. It's going to drain quicker. Silt's in the middle. You know, clay is going to drain the slowest. You know, why that's important is really for a couple of reasons. One, you know, the watering schedule for a person with a sand lawn is certainly going to be different than somebody with a clay lawn. And then when you're doing um, you know, fertilizer applications, pesticide applications, a lot of times you'll see rates that are different depending on your soil structure. So it's really kind of important to know what you're starting with so you know how to um, you know, kind of maintain your property going forward. So why does soil health matter? So we've kind of talked about a little bit of this already. You know, <clears throat> does a lot of different things, but you know, the USDA, defines soil health as continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So, you know, the five things it's regulating are water, plant and animal life, buffering and filtering pollutants, cycling nutrients, and providing physical stability and support. Um, you know, and again, that doesn't matter if we're talking about a golf green or my wife's garden, those are all important to the soil and to the plants. So obviously we can't read this, but this, these couple of slides just kind of show the importance of soil. You know, USDA and, and certain and other companies are investing a lot of money in soil remediation. Um, obviously carbon is a big talking point these days, uh, as well as pollution. Um, you know, I think we're, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, but kind of rediscovering as in the world, you know, maybe we've taken our eye off the ball with soil health. So this, there's plenty of articles out there you can research to find out the importance um, different companies in the USDA are putting in soil health. So I think a good analogy for soil health is to think about a reef system in an ocean. So if you see that picture on the left, there's a nice coral reef. We've got plants in there. Little fish are eating the plants. Obviously the big fish are gonna eat the little fish and so on and so forth creates a nice, nice healthy ecosystem versus on the right, 
that might as well be a swimming pool, right? There's very little life in there. So think, think about your soil that same way. So, you know, what we see above ground is just a small portion of what's really going on. The, the really important things are going on below the, below the surface. There's a big synergetic relationship between the microbes in the soil and plant health. Okay, so pH, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Kyle, can you, can you get rid of that poll list on the, on the screen? Uh, you should just be able to drag it out of the way. It's, uh, it's, not, in, it's not in the view of, of what you're sharing. Okay. Sorry, folks, I'm uh, very technically challenged, I promise you. Um, so, <clears throat> so what is soil pH? So basically that's the, the measure of the alkalinity or the acidity of the soil. Um, and we're gonna talk about why that's important. Cal, I can't forward this screen with this poll result. All right, just close it then. Eric, can you guys see that? Yeah. People like Okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. So, um, again, the, the two there's two things we want to look for. And Michael. For, yes. Michael. So there's two things we want to look for. We're looking at a soil test. Um, there's obviously many things, but two two important things, two easy things to look for. pH. So again, the alkalinity and this and the acidity of the soil. The other one's going to be CEC, the cation exchange capacity. So in simple terms, that's really just your soil's ability to interact with different ions in the soil, which means that it's going to be more efficient taking up fertilizer and nutrients. So how do I identify these problems? So again, we're going to start with a soil test. And I kind of like to use the analogy of going to the doctor once a year. We might think we're healthy, um, you know, but if we get a checkup once a year, we do some blood work. There may be some underlying issues we don't know about. Um, hopefully the doctor can see those and then try to remedy those before they become a problem. Think about your soil the same way. So, um, you know, we often get questions, you know, when should I take a soil test? And, you know, really there's probably a couple of different times to think about that. One, I would say, if you've had a property for a while and your current program isn't working like it used to, maybe it's not re responding to the fertilizer that it always has or some pesticides aren't working, that's a good indication that it might be time to take a soil test. And then another time would be, you know, if you're a property manager and you inherit a new property, you don't have any records on what was done on that property, you really don't know what you're starting with. So again, to kind of get a snapshot of, of where to begin, let's take a soil test. So again, there's different soil tests. Um, you can get them from your local extension service. Um, several distributors have them. Um, you know, obviously the extension service soil test can be very, very basic. And, and for this purpose for today, that's what we're going to really talk about is just the CEC and the, and the pH. But, you know, if you're doing a golf green or a garden, some high-end ornamentals, it may be worth getting a diagnostic test. All right, so I'm going to show a couple examples here. So at the top in, in red, I've highlighted some, um, some things we want to look at. So Back when Miramichi Green came to market in 2014, you know, we needed some test data. We wanted to get our, our name out there and, and uh, prove that our products work. So uh, this is um, a, an example from NC State. And this is a new building they had on their Centennial campus. And this was a bioretention pond with some native plants in it. And I'm sure everybody knows what those are. You see those on commercial sites all the time. But basically, it's you know it has about four feet of engineered soil that's meant to be a, a filter that 
the captures run off from downspouts from the building, from the parking lot. Um, it's made to you know, go through you know drying and, and wet cycles. So um, once that filters, it gets into the groundwater and hopefully you know sends clean water downstream. But with that, you know those that filter medium, who knows what what's getting in there, right? It's probably some oil and chemicals from cars from the parking lot, some salts. Um, who knows what? But anyway, the plants that were in there were very chlorotic and just kind of tired looking. So we did a soil test again at NC State. So as you can see, I've highlighted right here, they've recommended 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet. The reason for that is this 5.2 pH. So when we think about pH, um, you know, really between six and seven is where most plants want to be to be healthy. Obviously, 5.2 is low. And keep in mind, pH is logarithmic. So to move pH one point up or down is essentially 10 times the number before or after it. So it's a huge, huge uh, move to try to, to go one even, even a half a point. So they're recommending 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet to raise that pH. And then the other thing we're going to look at here is the CEC. CEC is five. You know, typically we want to see pH in double digits. So you know, want to consider that as low as well. So I'll show you what we did here. So <clears throat> this is the control in orange. So if you see, we took different representative samples from this pond and around the outskirts of the pond. And you can see there's really only a couple of CECs in here that, that are even decent, 6.1, 6.6. Those are okay. Again, we want to be in, in double digits. So we took our soil amendment called carbonized PN. It's a blend of biochar carbon and organic compost. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And one of our liquid biostimulants, and we did an application to these plants. We took a soil test a year, almost a year later. You can see this was 9, 30, 14, 7, 9, 15. Look at the difference in this soil test and these CECs. In most cases, we've nearly doubled the CEC. And again, that's, that's a big deal. We want to, again, be in double digits for these CECs. Move on to the pH, same deal. So the, the control is in orange. And again, I showed that slide a minute ago, 5.2, really, really low. That's going to be difficult for almost any plant to grow. Um, again, took that soil test nearly a year later. That pH has moved almost a point in almost every single instance that we tested. And again, remember that's logarithmic. So um, when we get in this six to six and a half range, again, that's the sweet spot for you know, most plants we're trying to grow. So we're gonna talk about kind of how we did that and how this, how this works. All right, so if there's only one slide that we remember from today, I would say this is probably the most important to, to remember. And this is simply showing the availability of nutrients, why that pH is so important. So if we think about the big three, the, micronu the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, right there and again in that six to seven range, that's when most of these nutrients are available. If you go even a half a point one way or the other, you can see the availability goes way down. Now on the other extreme, I mean, we've got uh, micronutrients, those, some of those become actually more prevalent the more acidic you go or the more basic you go on the soil test. So you, you might think, well, maybe that's a good thing. In most cases, it isn't. Um, you know, in just like our human bodies, the plants need small amounts, trace amounts of these micronutrients, but in bigger amounts in these acidic ranges or the basic ranges, they can become toxic. So again, this center column, that six to seven range is really where we want to be. All right, so <clears throat> low pH, acidic soil, which really internationally, you're going to find more acidic soils than you are alkaline soils. Um, but we're going to talk about both. But a lot of the symptoms are the same. So obviously, decreased microbial and bacterial activity. You know, those, those bugs aren't going to live in acid soil. Um, and again, that synergistic effect between the root zone and the microbes is very important. Increased thatch layer, 
those kind of go hand in hand. If that bacteria and the microbes that normally eat thatch are not living in this low pH, that, that, that thatch is going to continue to build up if those things aren't chomping away. And that kind of goes hand in hand with water infiltration. If you've got a heavy thatch, you know, that water is going to run off during heavy rains, causing erosion and, you know, not getting into the soil where the roots need, you need that water. Obviously, in, in, uh, decrease in turf, turf grass vigor. Again, that doesn't matter if it's a grass blade or a tomato plant, uh, vigor is going to be down. Um, we just looked at that slide about uh, nutrient availability. And then I mentioned already the availability of aluminum in the root zone. Aluminum can be toxic in higher amounts. Really, a lot of these micronutrients can be toxic. Again, the importance of keeping that pH close to neutral. So on the other extreme, the alkaline soils, you know, soils above seven and a half, um, you know, a lot of these symptoms are going to be the same. I'm not going to, you know, go through all that. You guys can read that. But, um, you know, again, the importance of the soil test, we know if it's alkaline or acidic, we don't know until we take a soil test. But again, these symptoms are very similar. So <clears throat> this is a, just a chart kind of similar to the graph that I showed a minute ago, um, just a different way of looking at it, but um, just nutrient availability. So, you know, really, really important to keep in that six to seven range again. So if we look at this six and a half, getting 90% nutrient availability, look what happens if we go down just to five, it's less than half the nutrient availability. So you could go to your distributor, buy the most expensive bag of fertilizer they have. If your pH is only five or 5.2, like we showed in that previous slide, you're not even getting half the nutrients in that bag. So again, really, really important. I can't stress that enough about getting that pH where it needs to be. So when you do make applications, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. All right, so visual signs of bad soil. Again, a lot of this is going to be common sense. You know, if you see compaction or standing water, cracked soil, you know, obviously poor plant growth, and then disease and fungus. Um, you know, that's something maybe we don't think about enough. A lot of times, in ambiguity of this myself, um, we're quick to throw a chemical or a pesticide at what we think is a problem. Um, you know, and, and we may be better off in the long run to take better care of that soil. We're going to have to use hopefully use less pesticides in the future. It's kind of like us getting enough sleep, eating right, we're less likely to get sick. Um, it's really the same thing with your soil. You're gonna have less fungus and in, in, insect pressure if that soil is healthy. All right, so <clears throat> strategies to help resolve some of these conditions. So, you know, there's, there's some traditional ways of, of fixing some of these problems, right? So we've got lime, applications, I mentioned that earlier, that's gonna raise your pH. Sulfur applications for some of you folks out west or at the coast that have high pH, you have the opposite problem we do where I live. Um, you use sulfur and ammonium sulfate to bring that pH down. Gypsum applications, we don't really think about that so much as pH, that's more of a structural trying to you know, remedy clay or salt soils with gypsum. So what I'm gonna talk about next is maybe some different ways of adjusting these pHs and these CECs um, than maybe what we used to do in the past. And, um, I guess I'll start out by saying I've, I've been doing this long enough to remember you know, back in the day that organic-based products kind of had a negative connotation to them. Um, and we're, we're gonna talk about some organics, but you know, in the past, organics were really, really expensive. Uh, most of the time they didn't work. If they did work, they took a long time to work. So, you know, just, you know, um, even, you know, folks my age and older, I know we're kind of a sort of set in our ways and maybe poo-poo some of this, you know, organic talk, but, you know, I'm here to say that, you know, I'm, I'm an old dog that can learn some new tricks. So just try to keep an open mind. Um, we've come a long way as an industry on the organic side, not just, you know, Miramichi Green products, but products in general. Um, some of these organics are a lot better than even 10 years ago. All right, so how do we build healthy soil? So there's some cultural practices that don't involve chemicals. Obviously aeration, right? You're pulling a core out of the soil. Uh, you can add organic amendments. <clears throat> you can add inorganic amendments, which we don't see much of that anymore. That was kind of a thing back in the 80s and early 90s. We talked about soil tests, right? Getting a snapshot of, of what the problems might be in the soil. 
and then you know applying you know the fertilizers based on the recommendations of that test. All right, so carbonized PN. I mentioned that earlier. That was one of the products we used in that bioretention pond that I mentioned, where we help change those CECs and help raise that pH. So what is it? <clears throat> so carbonized PN is carbon plus nutrients. So it's biochar carbon combined with uh, an organic compost. So you know, essentially a 50-50 mix. So what is biochar? So you know, technically biochar can be made from you know, decayed plant material and it's put in a, in a furnace, almost like a giant kiln, like you would you know, make pottery out of. So what we do, we put that in a, in a heat, you know, high heat, and we remove the oxygen. So if you were just to burn you know, plant material, in this case, it's wood scraps from um, the, the paper wood industry. Um, if you were to, to burn that, obviously the byproduct of a fire is gonna be carbon dioxide. So the waste of that is going off into the atmosphere. We know what carbon dioxide does. We obviously don't wanna do that. So in order to make biochar, we remove the oxygen. So that actually keeps it from actually, you know, flaming and catching on fire. So what that does, it's burning off some of the ash and some of the impurities we don't want. It's leaving a very clean uh, carbon and that's sequestering that carbon, keeping that from going off into the atmosphere. Nice concentrated clean carbon. So if you look at this screenshot here at the very bottom right, that on our microscope, this has a porous structure. So that does a couple, um, has a couple of different benefits for the soil. So if you think about this honeycomb structure, obviously that's poor space. So I live in East Tennessee, heavy red clay soils where I am. Uh, our soils need all the help they can get as far as drainage. So think about this getting into a soil like mine, that's poor space for nutrients, for air, for water, even microbes to kind of you know, do their thing. Now, you know the opposite extreme, we could be at the coast or somewhere where they've got sandy soils. They have the opposite problem that I do. This same product can benefit sandy soils by help holding nutrients, holding water. So, you know, somebody at the coast is going to have to water a lot more than I do. This can help with that because they, these pore spaces can hold those nutrients, hold water. Once it gets saturated, it'll let it filter on through. When the soil dries back out, the plant can pull from it as it needs it. So. What's, what's really nice is it's, it's almost dummy proof. We've seen whether we're in the Bahamas on a golf course or again in heavy red clay in the mid-Atlantic, um, we're seeing you know, these, these benefits for that porous structure. <clears throat> the other thing that, that um, bio, this particular type of biochar carbon is doing is changing that pH. And we already talked about the importance of that, but we, we test our biochar, every load that we manufacture, and again, it's coming in that sweet spot about 6.3. And it's got a, I won't get into a long you know, chemistry lesson. We don't have time to get deep in the weeds on this, but this, you know, this type of biochar has a negative charge to it. So it's adhering to the positive soil colloids and, and that helps change that pH. So whether you're high or low, it wants to get everything to that 6.3, which really, really is again, beneficial to the soil and that plant health. Uh, the other benefit to this type of carbon is its long life. You know, essentially we can say this is, you know, a semi-permanent soil amendment. Um, you know, this type of carbon lasts for several hundred years in the soil before it starts to break down. So as long as it stays in the soil, it continues to, you know, kind of do its thing. Uh, the only time that would change is if you're, you know, physically removing it from the, from the soil. So, you know, if you're doing a garden or an annual bed where you're you know, pulling plants out every year, obviously some of this material is going with it, but if it's, you know, just a normal front lawn, it's going to stay there and continue to do its thing. So the other half of what's in that bag, again, is organic compost. So this slide on the left is showing we combine organic compost with this biochar carbon, we can actually grow biology. So what does that do? Well, there's that reef system over here on the right. So again, here's a small little plant up above the ground what we see with the naked eye, it's just a small portion of what's going on um, in the real world, right? Below ground is really where, where the plant health and soil health is. So uh, again, very, very important. Think about this network of roots, how far out that goes compared to what we see above ground. 
So I've talked a lot about these benefits. I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, again, C, C, pH are a big one. Um, heavy doses, we can actually help absorb some chemical spills and or um, you know, pet mis mis pesticide applications. Um, you can talk to your local uh, Miramichi rep to get more information about that. But um, we're seeing a lot of recovery. I'm going to show some photos, um, different products that I've been involved with that um, you know, kind of proof in the pudding. So rates, um, a little less than what you would typically think of as a soil amendment. You know, we've got to keep in mind this is not a fertilizer. This is a soil amendment. So you know, if you're, you know, at first glance, you're going to, you know, I know I did this. I looked at this, these, some of these rates and thought, wow, these are high rates, but I had to get out of my head that it's not a fertilizer. You know, fertilizers we're typically putting out at four to five pounds per thousand square feet. Um, again, we're trying to modify a soil. So if you think about even going six inches down into a volume of soil, that's just, that's a lot of soil. It takes a lot of material to move the needle again, whether you're trying to change pH, change CEC. That's um, so why we're going to look at the, the rates that they are. So, you know, um, typical lawn is going to be 20 to 40 pounds per thousand square feet, uh, which is why we sell these in 40 pound bags, just makes it simple. Um, you know, if you, if you apply 20 to 40 pounds per thousand, you don't have any leftover, it makes it easy to do the math. Um, question we get all the time is how much per year do I need to do? Um, what we recommend is, is 20 pounds per thousand per year. If you have decent, you know, plant growth, your soil looks healthy, uh, nothing is really out of whack. Now, you know, if your soil test comes back and your pH is off, your CECs are off, or again, you're having some issues with your, fer your fertility, you're not responding like it used to, um, we probably want to increase, you know, again, take a soil test and look at probably increasing from that 20 to 40 pounds per thousand to possibly you know 80 or 100 pounds per thousand. So you know, it's kind of a case by case scenario. Obviously every soil is different, even in the same neighborhood or even on the same property, they, they can vary. All right, so I'm gonna show a few examples. Um, this is a, a private club in outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, where I used to live. Uh, this, the superintendent here in the center, doing some, some trials. He's putting out carbonized PM. He's gonna compare that to a starter fertilizer, um, a biostimulant, a little organite, and then just a control with nothing. And, and this came right from his Twitter account. Here's the control with nothing. You can see a couple little roots sticking out and look at three days, all these tiny little root hairs coming out. And we really see sod respond well. You know, if you think about sod, growing into sod farm, it's kind of babied its whole life. Um, it's watered at the right time, fertilized at the right time. It's you know meant to you know come to you as a nice, good-looking finished product. Well, what happens? We come in there with a sod cutter and completely stress it out right from the start. So anything we can do to enhance this this um, soil to root contact and get that tack down is just going to be that much healthier, that much quicker. And this is Bermuda grass. Um, We've seen this with bent grass. We've seen this with joyza. Everything in between, we really see rooting usually in three or four days, and it doesn't seem to matter what kind of grass it is. Um, here's bent grass up in Ohio. This is a driving range tee. Straight sand is the SS. You've seen these in divot mixes if you play golf. Um, superintendent mixed twenty five percent of the carbonized PN, and look at the results off to the right. So look how dark this is. That's only twenty five percent mixed in that sand. Look how dark and rich that is, that carbon and that organic. So three weeks later, he sent me this picture. You can see the straight sand on the left starting to grow in. You can still kind of see the divots. Noticeably improved on the right, almost completely grown in. So a lot of superintendents are mixing their own divot mix um, just on site You know, using these products, just getting quite a quicker recovery. <clears throat> so this, um, this, is, this is the first big uh, sports field project I was involved with when I started with Miramichi Green. This is UNC Chapel Hill football field. They had stripped the sod off. They're going to resod the same day. You can see Casey is actually applying this with a top dresser. We didn't talk about applications, but anything with a belt driven 
um, base to kind of push the material out is going to spread this product really well. It unfortunately doesn't go out real well in a, in a spreader, push spreader, but we do have other products that are spreadable. But <clears throat> here he is, you know, going front to back. He also went side to side to kind of get even coverage. Blade saw that same day. He called me a couple weeks later, said, hey, Michael, when do you think I can aerate? And uh, I said, gosh, Casey, how long has it been? It's any even been a month yet, has it? And so now it's been like 14 days and um, I can't find any spots that aren't tacked down. I want to aerate and, and kind of level this field. I've got some undulations and some seams. So here's the picture he sent me. So this is two weeks after laying that sod. You can see he's got some seams and some low spots. His idea was to let these cores dry out, and drag these in as top dressing, and kind of fill in the dips and the low spots. And for those of you that don't know, this is an adjustable aerator. So he's got this almost all the way to the most aggressive setting. You can see how tight these cores are. And he said in this whole field, just a couple spots pulled up. And again, this is only two week old sod. You know, traditionally we would think, you know, you're not gonna put an aerator on sod for at least six or eight weeks. So tremendous recovery. Um, again, getting that and the importance of that sod soil root contact. Here it is <clears throat> three weeks later. I mean, it's ready for play. They were practicing playing games on, on this field, brand new field within a month. Um, you switching gears from turf grass. So crepe myrtle, this is at my parents' house. They live down in South Carolina, retired there a few years ago. Um, they lived there almost three years. This crepe myrtle had never bloomed in the time that they lived there. It would leaf out in the spring, look like this all summer and leaves will fall off in the fall, I'll do the same thing. I was visiting my parents last summer. My dad was giving me help saying, hey, you need to fix my plants. Tree looks like crap. So I happen to have some um, carbonized PN and one of our liquid biosimilants with me in my truck. So you can barely see this the bottom here. I put a ring of the carbonized PN around the base of that tree. I took a bucket of water, filled that five gallon bucket up, put a couple ounces of our liquid biostimulant in there. And I took a small little uh, garden claw digger and I slowly work, worked that liquid in and worked that claw digger to kind of work everything into that soil and drench that plant. So I took this picture on the left before I left, 4th of July weekend, told my parents to keep an eye on it. You know, let me know when it changes. I didn't know if it would take a month or two months. Um, it was almost five weeks to the day my mom sent me this photo. And I can promise you neither she or I are technical enough to know how to do Photoshop. So the first time in almost three years, this tree not only bloomed, but it grew like a foot. And what I like about this is very simple, right? It's just a bucket, a claw digger, and uh, you know, a couple products. So, you know, in a lot of these cases, if you're a say you're a yard maintenance person. Maybe you're afraid of, you think you need an arborist to treat a tree or a shrub. A lot of times it's just um, simple of getting that soil healthy and that plant's gonna grow. You're already on that property anyway. Uh, hopefully the landowner, homeowner trusts you. You're out there every week, you have your eyes on, you know, things that maybe need to be repaired. So think about this maybe as a extra revenue stream. If you are a, um, you know, mainly into lawn maintenance, it doesn't take a lot to change the health of a tree. Um, here are some, some photos that came from one of our customers down in Savannah. So if any of, it, any of you all traveled to Savannah, you know they have long, narrow alleyways in between houses. Properties are long and narrow versus wide. A lot of shade. Obviously, it doesn't matter what kind of grass you have. Shade's very difficult to grow grass. So customer sent me this picture week one. You can kind of see some of the carbonized PNs or that dark area. He top dressed this whole lawn. He also sprayed our 901C, which is one of our liquid biostimulants. He did all that week one. He didn't do anything else. So he came back you know, over a four week period and took kind of a time last um, photo, sent these to me as he was going. Um, just tremendous results again. And look how shady this is. You got big magnolias on this side, you know, a giant house on the right. Very, very little sun getting in here. Week four, these thin areas are almost completely filled in. Again, this is warm season turf, but you know, for the you know, folks up in 
in the north with uh, Kentucky bluegrass, and bent grass that kind of creeps in on its own, uh, you can expect these same kind of results. So uh, again, no, no fertility, just trying to get that soil healthy um, really goes a long way. So I know nobody knows what this is, but um, for you West folks, West Coast folks, um, this is obviously a California house plant. So <clears throat> this was sent to me from a greenhouse grower. Um, obviously it's hemp plant. So on the left, he's a normal potting mix uh, that a typical greenhouse grower would use. Planted that plant on the right, kind of similar to the slide a couple slides ago where I showed where they mixed 25% in the divot mix. Same deal here, 25% mixed in planting mix. These are side by side in the greenhouse. They're getting the same amount of water, same amount of sunlight. Nothing's changed on fertility. Just 25% of that carbonized pea and added into this mix. Look at the difference in that plant. Here's an aerial photo. I mean, we're looking at you know, nearly three times the surface area. So, you know, um, I know, I don't know if there's any growers on the, on the webinar here, but um, I know pennies matter when you're talking about potted plants. But to me, if I look at this, you know, when you're talking about pennies per plant and get that kind of growth and healthy plant that much quicker, um, kind of think about that maybe as an insurance policy for um, you know, long-term future greenhouse growth. So really that kind of concludes um, what I wanted to share today as far as some of these photos. Um, you know, here's the slide of, we've got you know, reps all around the country to help people out. Um, uh, sorry, <clears throat> Kyle already introduced Yolani and Alex. Um, I sure appreciate everybody's time. I know it's a busy time of year, fall. People are fertilizing, it's leaf season. Um, probably got better things to do than listen to me chat away, but certainly appreciate everybody's time. Uh, I'd like to take the first question if, if somebody has some questions they'd like to answer. Yeah, Michael, one of the questions that we received was um, if we're just putting carbonized PN on top, um, how does it drive roots down into the soil if it's just a top layer? So that is a good point. It doesn't do any good just to be on the surface. So it eventually needs to get into the soil. So um, a great time to do that is during either before or after aeration. If you think about pulling a core out of the soil, when, when you do top dress, obviously the carbonized pin is gonna get in there. Um, irrigation and rainfall helps. Um, you don't necessarily have to aerate. Um, what we don't wanna do is you put it out and have a gully washer and it's not gonna do any good going downstream. So that is something to think about. It's just like fertilizer, right? If it, if it sits on top, it's not gonna do any good until it gets into the soil. So um, it does need to be watered in and or you put in it with an aerator. A lot of sports field folks and golf course superintendents will actually drag it in. You obviously you can't do that with long turf on a, you know, on a front yard, but on shortcut turf, you can have a brush or a drag mat to help drag it in and then water it. Thanks, Michael. We have, we have a question about how does carbonized, carbonized PN specifically relate to some of the more spreadable granulars uh, in the category? When would you use this versus uh, versus another spreadable granular soil amendment? So if we're talking about you know, Miramichi green products, this carbonized PN is, is really the foundation of all the products that we make. So you know, from day one, we knew, um, I'll just go back from you know, personal experience. I never, never had anybody say that it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, even price point rarely got any pushback on price. However, the, you know, the pushback we did get was spreadability. So we knew from day one, it wouldn't go out in a rotary spreader or a drop spreader. So um, it took us a while to kind of perfect how to spread that. So, um, you know, that's, there's not a real easy answer for that question, if if you've got a big lawn, um, you can only spread. You've only got capability of you putting it out with a rotary spreader, which which is typical, right? Most landscapers aren't going to have a top dresser, um, so you're kind of limited to spreadability. So that's when you know when some of the bag the other bagged granular products 
come to light. So, you know, without being, you know, getting too deep in the weeds, all the granulars that we manufacture do you have carbonized PN in them? There's going to be, you know, depending on which product it is, there's going to be more or less, you know, depending on the breakdown, um, carbonized PN by itself just is not spreadable. So, you know, if I've got a small area, like, you know, some thin areas of my lawn, I just kind of chicken feed it out like I showed in that golf course photo. Um, obviously, you're not going to do that with a 10,000 square foot lawn. So in that case, you know, talk to your, your rep or your distributor and um, you know, we can get you hooked up with the right spreadable but you know for all intents and purposes the you know that is the the carbonized pn is kind of the base for all the granular spreadables so michael we uh one of one of the uh 25 or so jason hinkley's on the call um pointed out that we have um mostly uh, alkaline soils uh, out west can you can you uh, we spoke, spoke mostly about acidic soils can you uh can you reiterate how this product uh works in terms of a ph buffer um, even in alkaline soils? Yeah, so um, again, the, the, the biochar that's in the product has a, has a slight negative charge. So, and, and again, um, I probably didn't mention this before, but biochar, just like a lot, a lot of other products um, that started with raw materials, the raw materials are really what's gonna make a difference in the long-term effect of that product. So you've gotta start with the right the right raw material. So, you know, the pH can be all over the board depending on what your source of biochar is. Our particular source, again, comes in at 6.2, 6.3 on a pH scale. So it wants to pull everything because it has that slight negative charge. Most of your soil colloids are a positive charge. So think of like a kind of a, you know, a, a magnetic attraction. It's pulling those soil colloids into that neutral range. So um, you know, I hate to use the word idiot proof, but in my mind, it kind of is idiot proof. Um, you know, I spent a lot of years, you know, traveling as a sales rep for different distributors and it was always, you know, kind of difficult to remember, okay, I'm at the coast or I'm out West. I got to remember, we got to bring pHs down here. That's the main problem, you know, in the, you know, in the mid Atlantic and most of the South, we need to bring pHs up. I got to remember which products do what. Well, 6.3, again, is ideal for, you know, most of the plants we're trying to grow. So, um, you know, as far as whether your soil is alkaline or acidic, you know, that 6.3 of that, of the biochar that's in the product is going to want to, you know, kind of get pulled into that neutral range. So um, how much that takes, again, it's going to depend on that soil structure. Some, I've seen some pHs move after one application. Sometimes it takes several years and or, I'm sorry, several applications or a couple of seasons to kind of get everything dialed in. So, you know, hate to be so vague, but again, soil structures are so different and climates are different. You know, folks out West, you're dealing with a lot of salts in your soil. Um, if you can flush that salt out, you're not getting enough rain to, you're basically trying to grow plant material on, you know, ground up rocks, right? So. Without rainfall, you know, those rocks have a lot of salt content. So if you can't flush that salt out, it's probably gonna take more applications of carbonized PN or one of the other granulars to change that pH than it would be in a soil that, you know, maybe if you move further east where you're getting more rainfall and getting some of those salts flushed out. But again, that, you know, when we're getting these, these loads tested, that 6.2, 6.3 range is really gonna you know, help pull that, whether it's high or low, help pull that pH into that zone. Okay, what other questions we have? Um, Tom's answering a few of the questions in the chat. So we're gonna try to, try to uh, speak to them here as well. We've got a few questions about sand blending and, and how that's, um, what our recommendations are if you're working with a local sand blender. Uh, mm -hmm. for an aeration type sand, you know, what's, what's the recommendations for a ton? You know, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, typically, and, and again, you know, we're, we're golf heavy on the top dressing. So that's going to be most of my experience, um, is, um, golf course greens and also sports fields. Most of those folks are going to do a, a 90, 10 blend. So 90% sand, 10% carbonized PN. 
Um, you know, we've seen it a little bit higher, seen a little bit lower, kind of depends on, on what the long-term goal is. Um, you know, again, most of these soil, most of these sports fields and golf greens are sand, so, or mostly sand, which means that they have very, very low CECs. And again, if we remember the, the sandy structures, the, the sandy structure combined with low CEC means we're gonna leach nutrients, we're gonna leach water much quicker than a native soil. <clears throat> so a lot of times they're gonna um, add that carbonized pH to kind of give it some substance and make it more like a soil. You know, they can't have true soil because of the compaction. Um, you can't have, you know, 50,000 rounds of golf on a, you know, on a clay green and expect that grass to live in an eighth of an inch. So that's why they have sand. But for home lawns, um, honestly, it's going to bet on somebody's budget and kind of what they're working with. Um, again, if it's a golf green or a sports field, you know, 90, 10 blends typical. If we're doing a home lawn, um, a lot of times people will, you know, go more of that 30 or 40% carbon ISPN. Um, Again, it's going to depend on their fertility and their soil structure. Thanks. Uh, Bradley Gentry has a has a another question about pH. Bradley, that one's um, something we've got some some text information about. So I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up after the meeting uh, with you on that, uh, talking about how carbon ISPN impacts the chemical structure uh, of the soil, not just the the texture. Um, so I'm gonna follow up with you on that. I think it'll make more sense with some uh, some diagrams we have. Um, Matthew uh, asks, is there a latent quality to these products? He's had customers saying that they apply it, you know, it's maybe 15 pounds per, uh, uh, per square foot. Um, I'm not sure if that's right, <laughs> um, probably per thousand, but uh, didn't see the results they were expecting. Is it possible there's stuff happening below the soil and it's latent and it, you know, they haven't seen the benefits yet. So what, what should folks be expecting throughout the year um, after they apply the product in terms of visible results? Um, gosh, that's so area dependent. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I mean, if, it, if, if the lawn is green, um, we're not going to get it any greener, right? This is not a fertilizer. What we usually see results wise is, um, and, and we, a lot of times we kind of use this as a sales pitch, like, Hey, give us, give us your troubled areas. And then you're going to see the response. If, if you're, if you go out to your front yard and it's your you know, you do your five or six apps a year, whatever you do, and it's nice and green and lush. Um, you're not going to put out carbonized in and then a month later say, oh, my gosh, it's even more green. Um, what this is doing, and we, we do see green up again, but it's it's when there's something wrong. Um, now, if the question is that there is something wrong, say the pH is off or soil structure is poor and they're not seeing results, um, I would just verify that it did get into the soil, that it didn't, you know, wash away with a heavy rain. Um, think about aeration too. I, we did talk, you know, about uh, cultural practices briefly. Um, you know, really, even on a home lawn, you really want to try to aerate at least every couple of years, get that core pulled. That help again helps nutrients and air space get into that root zone. Um, so I would ask the whoever asked the question maybe reach out to me or somebody specifically with um with the details on that and we could probably help shed some light on uh, maybe what's going on and, and why they aren't seeing the results they want okay uh kathy asks uh would we recommend carbonized pn as an amendment prior to planning anything and um, some of you are writing in your questions via direct message to one of the hosts. That's great. Uh, some of you are putting it in the every, you know, in the channel for everyone to see. That's that's great too. Um, this is the first time we're giving this. This is great feedback, uh, Kathy. I'm I'm shocked that we didn't think to put a slide in on exactly when we recommend uh, carbonized PN versus others. And of course, um, I'll take first crack at that, Michael. That we tend to think about carbonized PN um, as a great install product. So anytime we're planting. Uh, so before we're laying down sod or before we're planning 